Good evening, and welcome to the Campus 180 Connect series of mini retreats. We're really excited that you could be here, and I'm super excited to share with you about the three relationships. Um, this material comes from New Song Church, uh, started out in California. My personal mentor from my college days, Wes Coddington, helped develop the three relationships uh, in this series about becoming a true disciple of Christ by focusing on three relationships. Our relationship with God, our relationship with the church, and our relationship with the world. Throughout this uh, series of retreats, we are going to be utilizing the Three Relationships website. It's threerelationships.com. You can spell three or write the number three. You can use .com, .net, .org. They own it all. It's all bringing you to the same place, three relationships. You'll see a Venn diagram with three circles that'll say God, church, world. You'll know you're in the right place. Um, so have that ready or on your phone. Explore that website during downtime or in between the retreats. And during this time, we are going to be talking this retreat about our relationship with God Next month, we'll focus our relationship with church, and the final month in May, we'll focus our relationship on the world. Now, as we do this, we are going to be taking the three relationship assessment on the website, and it guides us not through how good we're doing or are you doing enough in certain areas. The questions that we're asking ourselves is not, do I know enough or do I do enough? It's, who am I at my core? Is my identity shaped by my relationship with God? Am I being obedient to his call to make disciples, to increase the church? And am I willing to do that out in every part of the world? Uh, during our talk tonight, we're going to be focusing on the Great Commission and what Jesus called the disciples to, how if you and I today, 2,000 years after Jesus, have any sort of faith and trust in who God is through Scripture, through the Bible, um, through the stories of Jesus, it's because 12 guys stood with Jesus and obeyed his commandment to make disciples. I'm really excited about this because so much of our church culture talks about making disciples. We have all sorts of programs, events, different things that we say, this is disciple making. Or if people come to our church program on a Sunday morning, this is going to make them a better disciple. Um, but if you're like me, you've been on service projects, maybe even mission trips. You've been to dozens of Sunday services, maybe campus ministry meetings. And you crave, you want a deep relationship with God. You want to feel that these things are, are true, that they're real, that they're making a difference in your life. And so often you can walk away from a Sunday morning service or a campus ministry activity and just slide right back into the same patterns of relationship dysfunction with people, uh, anxiety, insecurity, sin patterns, all this stuff. Shouldn't the fact that I was at church, shouldn't the fact that I attended these ministry events change something inside of me? And the reason it doesn't is because the patterns or rhythms in our life are really deeply entrenched. You know, we go back to what's familiar. We go back to what's comfortable. And this series about the three relationships, about connecting better with God, connecting better with his church, and connecting in the way he instructs us with the world, it doesn't just change what we know. It doesn't just give us a new check mark to accomplish for God each day or each week or each month. It actually starts to alter who we are at the core. It changes who I am by changing the rhythms and the patterns of my day-to-day -day life. So I am super excited to go through with you on the three relationships. Now I've used these terms uh, rhythms and you can understand them as rhythms or patterns, um, but this is how the three relationships work. It breaks down our relationship with God, the church and the world 
into five rhythms each. So tonight, as we discuss our rhythms with God, our relationship, what that dynamic looks like, what's the give, what's the take, um, how, how do I take all these things that church has been telling me to do, I feel like I should do, like praying, reading the Bible, sharing the gospel, um, going to church regularly, all these different things that I feel compelled to be a part of, that I've been doing, why aren't they making a difference? Why aren't they altering how I feel? Why do I still feel so often that my prayers are shooting out of my mouth, hitting the ceiling, and crashing back down to the ground? Why do I read the Bible and it doesn't engage my imagination? It, it just, it's a little tidbit. I don't know how to really take what's being presented in front of me without the help of a pastor or without some instruction from someone smarter or wiser than me. Jesus did not intend us to live our whole Christian life relying on others to drag us forward. He invited us into relationship with him so that through that relationship, we could be transformed, we could be made new, we could have entirely new um, motivations and core personality traits and you know different things that drive us to action, to forgiveness, towards genuine love and generosity and kindness. These are the things we want from everyone else in the world. It's the things that we crave other people would do to us. And Jesus made a way so that we could do it first. We could set the example. And because of our relationship with him, and because we come back to the church, the body of believers, we get what we crave because that body is functioning well, it's in a good rhythm, then we can go out into the world and invite them into relationship with God, and invite them into relationship with the church. So these rhythms tonight, uh, we'll talk about our relationship with God, then you'll do the assessment on the threerelationships.com website, and you'll get evaluated, not just in the area of God, all three areas you'll be evaluated with, and you can look ahead and see where you are, but in your small group time, um, before the main talk, You'll just share with your leaders and with your fellow group members. What has my relationship with God been like? What is my relationship with the church like? What has made it good? What has made it hard? What has made it difficult? What's my relationship with the world? Do I tend to trust things that the church says more than the world says? Or vice versa? Does the church make me suspicious of the world? What's going on in these dynamics? What are the rhythms I've recognized in myself. And so your small group leaders will kind of ask questions to develop those things more. You'll only have like five minutes each to share. So be thinking about it already. What's been my relationship with God? What's been my relationship with his church? What's been my relationship with the world? Um, that's going to generate some really deep conversations for you. And as the three relationships have been presented at different churches and with different people. One of my favorite stories that my uh, mentor Wes tells is that they give these cards with the Venn diagram of God, church, and the world to people and just say, just talk with someone you don't really know in this conference that well. Talk about these three relationships in your life. And he gave those cards to the girls running the sound booth. And these girls have worked together five years and they can't really split off and find people they don't know because they have to make sure everything's running smooth for the event. And they came up to us after the event was over, and they said, we, we, we've worked together for five years. And that right there, that, that 10 minutes of sharing what our relationship was like with God, the church, and the world, that was the deepest spiritual conversation we've ever had with each other. And they knew each other. They served together. They were being obedient to their church. They were being servicing. They were being um, generous with their time, they were being obedient. They were checking stuff off their list. But here, five years in, because of these questions and, and what it means and what it reveals about us, it generated a deep conversation and a deep connect connection. And I hope it does that for you guys in your small groups too. I know it's strange on Zoom and Discord and you know, distanced by the internet and these kind of imitation ways we do community now. I hate doing this pre-recorded thing on this camera right now. If you could see the setup around me, it is a mess. Just setting up cameras and lights and microphones. Um, 
But there's still opportunity. God is not limited by what's able to be accomplished in person or over internet. He's not limited by a perfectly peaceful and quiet place to focus on him or a chaotic, noisy space. One of the things we have to learn is to engage God right where we are in the setting that we're in, in whatever ways he's called us to engage him. And so I hope that this retreat tonight and the next two really engage your imagination on can I have a deeper, more authentic, more vibrant relationship, connection with God? Can I actually be engaged with the people of his church in a way that feels like I'm in a community with my brothers and sisters? I'm in a family that has the same sense of values, the same core identity, um, the same... Can I just be in a church where we like each other? Sometimes that seems like a lot to ask. Um, and then can I, can I see the world not as something hostile, not as something dangerous, not as something tempting, but a place that God has called me to love, called me to grow, called me to, to work in and reach out to. Because it, it's not that they're lost. It's not that they're you know, eternally separated from God yet. You know, God's call for us is to invite that world into the church and the church into relationship with God. And these are the rhythms we want to see you develop. So... Take your time seriously. Um, do the assessment the best way you can. You can kind of fly through it pretty fast when the time comes and you'll be given time in your small groups. Um, but engage with what we're talking about in the three relationships. Ask yourself serious questions and be a little bit vulnerable. Be a little bit honest in your small group about what these things have been like for you in the past and what you imagine they could be like in the future. And each um, retreat, you're going to leave with some homework to do. Um, one area, again, going back to the Three Relationships website, one area where you can focus on, I want to improve this rhythm. So um, in the main session, we'll talk a little bit about the specific rhythms in our relationship with God, and I'll give you some examples on what you'll do through them. But um, as you're with us at this retreat, be open be honest, be a little bit vulnerable. You got some nice distance because of the screen, because of Discord between you and everyone else. Um, but just open up and, and be open to God, you know, challenging you, um, challenging the way you've thought. I mean, if you can do church and ministry your whole life and feel like you agree with everything that's ever presented to you, I feel like that's a, that's a form of Christianity that's catered to your preferences and not designed to help us be obedient to Jesus. And that's what it's all about. Jesus did not call us to comfort. He did not call us to conformity. He didn't call us to success even. He called us to obedience. He called us to faithfulness. He called us to love. And... Those three things, faithfulness, obedience, and love, they're going to challenge us. They're going to stretch us. They're going to make us uncomfortable because there's going to be people that you don't want to love. There's going to be people that you don't want to be generous with. There's going to be people in the world and in the church and sometimes even God that you get angry with. And that's okay. Part of the rhythms is to deal with the hard emotions of a relationship. And we'll talk about that a lot more in the coming retreats. So buckle up, good luck, and we are praying that this Connect series of retreats moves you deeper in your relationship with God, with the church, and with the world. Have fun! Good evening. 
Welcome to the Connect series of mini retreats. My name is Jeff Pilger. I'm a Campus 180 minister at Monroe Community College in Rochester, New York. If you don't know me, um, my family consists of my wife, Asia, my 15-year-old daughter, Allison, who I'm praying for fervently as we just sent her by herself on a plane down to Florida to visit her grandmother, um, my son, Liam, who's going to turn 11 on Friday. We just call him kind of the walking tornado because there's always a mess behind him wherever he goes. And I have a three-year-old daughter, Lauren, who God surprised my wife, Asia, and I with um, after we thought we couldn't have kids anymore. And she is three. She's amazing. Biggest smile in the world. Cute little dimples and a little rebellious right now in her threes. So... Um, I'm a big nerd. I like comics and comic book movies. I just finished watching an episode of The Falcon and Winter Soldier on Disney+, Plus, and I'm excited about that show. Love board games and comics and everything. Um, so that's me. And tonight, we're going to dive into the first of the three relationships, our relationship with God, by looking at Jesus' last words. Now, keep important keep in mind how important last words are. Um, if you've ever kind of been to a hospice place or, or visited a, a relative that was kind of nearing the end of their life, you know, they're sick and in the hospital and in and out of consciousness, but they kind of have their wits about them enough to call you close to their side and say, I have something to say. That's not the time when you get on your phone and check your social media feed, you know, when someone says their last words, you lean in really close. You want to hear what they have to say. And Jesus' last words to his disciples were instructions for what he wanted them to do after he wasn't going to be physically with them anymore. And before we get into those last words, which are found in Matthew 28, so you can be getting your Bibles or Bible apps and flipping over or scrolling to Matthew 28, I want you to think about starting a new job. Um, if you've had a job for any sort of organization, you know, there's like certain training that goes with it. Sometimes they'll pair you up with someone that's doing the job that you're going to be doing. So you learn the ropes and you see how it's done a bit. Um, but usually before you're totally ready, the training wheels come off and you're tossed into it. About five years ago, I became a teacher's assistant at a school for kids um, who were experiencing difficulty completing their education because of mental, emotional, or behavioral challenges. It was a small special education school, and I was going to be a teacher assistant that helped manage the classroom and kind of sit with kids as they were going through their work, help them out if they were experiencing some trouble, um, or you know, just meeting needs in the classroom for the students or the teacher. And I did my two weeks of training, and it wasn't about being a math teacher assistant. It was about the organization. It was about trauma-informed therapy. It was about you know sick days and vacation times and organizational stuff. But after two weeks of training, I finally got to show up to the classroom. And first period, we do homeroom. I get the kids some breakfast and help them get situated for their day bell rings, everyone's off, the new students come into class for geometry, and the teacher hands me a book and points to two girls and says, take them over to this room and help them with this section of geometry. And it had been a long time since I had studied geometry, and so right there, first day, first period, I'm already feeling out of my depth. And I'm happy to say that those girls both graduated despite my best efforts to sabotage their math scores. Um, but again, when I transitioned in the agency to doing community care management, they gave me training, they showed me what to do, they had me shadow some other people doing the same job, and then before you know it, they handed me my computer and said, here's everything you got to do. And keep your charts really detailed. Make sure you check off all the boxes. Get it all done. Get all the documents signed. Upload everything. Make sure it's on time. Go. Just do it. And, and again, I just felt so out of my depth. And I imagine, as, as I still struggle with Jesus' words here in Matthew 28, that the disciples may have felt out of their depth as well. 
And so if you look, Matthew 28, starting in verse 18, it says this. Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Again, last words, important words. Here in Matthew, at the end of every gospel, at the beginning of Acts, five times in Scripture, these instructions are given. And if you study the original language, it's one commandment. Make disciples. And we like to complicate things by focusing on baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Spirit, teaching them to do everything I commanded. But the way they understood it, one commandment, make disciples. And the baptizing and teaching is what you do to do that. And so as we consider these words of Jesus, all authority, he says, is given to him. Go to all nations, make disciples. Three relationships. Jesus said it. He is God. He says, make disciples, make the church, and do it around the world, in all the earth. God the church, the world. Go make disciples of the world. Big command, big expectation. And as I read it, I still feel the weight of it. I still feel that I can't do it yet because I'm not prepared. But just like geometry class, just like care management, and just like the disciples, Jesus pushes us out of the boat before we're ready to swim. You know, and he says, you'll learn. You'll learn as you go. So as we get into this idea of, of how is this going to build my relationship with God? How does this commandment encourage me to develop my relationship with God? To develop good patterns and good rhythms? The big question we have to answer is, what the heck is a disciple? Because... We in the church in America today, 2021, have a lot of ideas about what discipleship means. We have all sorts of book series and curriculum programs. Uh, our churches have Sunday school classes and small groups and series they can attend. You know, here's the 10-week discipleship course you need to take to be a fully developed disciple of Jesus. I attended a Bible college, studied youth ministry, and one of my final projects for a youth ministry class is have a description of a fully discipled young adult. You know, what does a person look like when they're discipled? And how do you disciple them to that point? And so I'm like studying the Bible, and I'm reading all these books, and I'm studying all these different ways we think about discipleship. And I have my whole plan. And I came across that a couple years ago, and I was embarrassed because <laughs> I was like, if I had the chance to do youth ministry again, I was a youth pastor for 10 years, if I had a chance to do it again, this assignment would not be part of it at all. Yeah. Um, sometimes churches say, hey, just coming to Sunday service you know, the, the singing, the worship songs, the praying together, the sermon from Scripture, that's part of how we do discipleship. You know, get, get, a, get a mentor, and that person will disciple you. It doesn't matter what our approach is, or what classes we have, or what curriculum or books. What matters is what Jesus thought a disciple was, and what these guys that wrote our Scriptures understood a disciple to be. And to look at that, you know, we have to understand the culture that Jesus was calling these guys to be disciples in. The Jewish culture was very devoted to the instructions of God. You know, they had the five books of Moses, and from as young an age as they could start, they were training their young men and their young women, to memorize those scriptures. 
Now again, ancient cultures, men had all the advantages, women not so much. The Jewish culture did it pretty good compared to others, but still, um, the Jewish girls really only memorized Leviticus because it taught them uh, how to be ritually pure before God and help protect the purity of the people and if they were going to be good Jewish women and marry and have Jewish babies, they needed to do it in a way that kept the community ritually pure before God. The boys would work really hard to memorize Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, and Numbers all the way through in the hope for the Jewish boys, like if they wanted to be a successful Jewish member of their community, the highest success they could be was to be chosen as a disciple by one of the rabbis. Um, there weren't a ton of rabbis, as they've kind of looked at the historical record. They say, you know, maybe a couple dozen rabbis floating around there around the time of Jesus to actually allow people to follow them, to be their disciples. And the whole process was this. I have grown up, I've studied the Bible, I've memorized all the way, Genesis to Numbers. I know the words of Moses inside and outside. If a rabbi told me to quote a certain passage, I could do it on the spot without hesitation. And I'm hoping against hope that I'm prepared, that I'm devout, that I'm pious, that I'm religious, that I'm good enough. Because it wasn't just about the religious preparation and memorization. It was about... Um, how I carried myself, how well I looked, what my charisma was like. Because I had to find one of those rabbis, and there's only so many of them roaming around. And I had to go up to him and say, Rabbi, will you please let me be one of your followers? And the rabbi would challenge this seeker, saying, you know, quote me this passage, and quote me that passage. And you know that the prophet Amos said this. How did Moses and his words line up with the prophet? And, and, and he'd grill you, and he'd challenge you, and he'd put you on the spot. And after all of it, you know, if he didn't like the way your nose turned, or didn't like how bushy your eyebrows were, or didn't like the sound of your voice, he'd say, I'm sorry, you do not have what it takes to be my disciple. I cannot make you become like me. I'm sorry. Go back to your family business. Go back to whatever job is the fallback. But on the rare occasion that you answer every rabbi's questions exactly right, and you're tall enough and good-looking enough and have enough presence and gravitas, and the rabbi says to you, yes, yes, you I can make something of you. I can help you become like me. That was a huge deal. That was the biggest deal. The best way to understand it is to think about it in terms of someone trying to make a professional sports team nowadays, right? I grow up, you know, I love Bill's football. If you're a football fan or the Yankees, if you're into baseball, there's probably someone in soccer who's famous that's worth following if you're into that. Um, but your whole life, you're just like practicing in all your free time. You're out in the yard. You're, you're at the field. You're on the youth sports teams and on the high school teams. You're just dedicated that someday I'm going to be there. Someday I'm going to be on the TV. I'm going to be signing the autographs. autographs. I'm going to be making the winning plays. And when you're the one in a million kid that gets that opportunity, it's not just you whose life has changed. It's your whole family. And that's how it was for these Jewish boys and girls. You know, the Jewish boys that got selected to be a disciple of the rabbi, it changed everything for them and their extended family. This was it. You've reached the top. You read about the Pharisees, the Sadducees, those guys. Some of them had been chosen as disciples, and a lot of them hadn't been, but they just aligned with these religious um, parties to kind of complain about the Roman oppression and um, argue between each other about what the passages from Moses meant and all this other stuff. You know, but, but to be a rabbi's disciple was enormous. And discipleship was just, how can I be like you? 
How can I do what you do? How can I act like you act in every way of your life? And it's just a dedicated follow and watch and mimic. Follow and watch and mimic. Follow and watch and mimic over and over and over and over again. And then at some point, this rabbi says, you have been elevated and you are now a rabbi from me. And now this person gets to go and be the judge that turns away all those that aren't good enough, but for the one or two or three just perfect candidates, invite them to follow along and be their disciples. And this is what made Jesus so radically different. Now, Jesus says at one point to his disciples, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. Because it was completely on its head for the way that everyone else did rabbi-discipleship relationships. Everyone else, if you got up the guts, if you thought you had what it took, you approached the rabbi and begged him to take you. But Jesus, wandering by the lake, sees some fishermen over there and goes, they have what it takes to be like me and to do what I do. And he calls them away. Leave your father's fishing business, drop the nets, forget the fish, come and follow me. And this is just so mind-blowing out of this world that they did it immediately. Matthew, a tax collector, an agent for Rome among his own people, considered a traitor, taking taxes, collecting for himself and for the Roman government from his own people, Jesus stops and says, I know tax collecting is a good gig for you financially, but I want you to come and follow me. And Matthew does. He drops it. He leaves it behind to follow Jesus because this is life-changing. This changes everything they thought about their future. To be called to be Jesus' disciples is so radical, so incredible, you know, so miraculous and fortuitous that it changed everything they understood about themselves and everything they thought about their future. And, and, and this belief Jesus has in people that you can be like me and you can do what I do. This is exactly why over and over and over again in the Gospels, they're going along and the gospel writers tell us that the disciples were arguing about who was going to be the greatest in Jesus' kingdom. Because Jesus believed in them in such a way that they, they thought that they were going to be the greatest. They knew they were going to be the greatest. Jesus then says, hey, you're going to do greater things than I do. Now, how, how is anyone going to do greater things than Jesus does? You know, I just read a devotional on this. It said, like, it, it, it's not about the substance being more significant. It's about how much more impressive it is. It's the difference between Jesus could do three three-point um, baskets on a basketball court all day long, and it just, you know, gets old because he's just racking up points and defeating the opponent all day, all the time. You know, but when the kid that rode the bench gets called in, because no one else is eligible to play at the end of the game, and it's all tied up, and he makes a three-point buzzer beater, that we watch over and over and over again. Jesus made the three-pointers easy. This guy, in a clutch moment, did something that we would consider greater because of the circumstances. And, and, and the fact that Jesus called these disciples, and everyone that is their legacy, that believed because of them and calls you and me to be his disciples, to do greater things than he did. You know, we're the kids on the bench that are making three-point shots at the buzzer. You know, when we are obedient and someone's life is changed because they got to interact with us, you know, someone's life changing because they got to interact with Jesus makes sense. But someone's life changing because they got to interact with you and me, that's wild. 
But that's exactly what we're called to. To do what he did to be like him. To be his disciples. So how how are we going to participate in making disciples? How do we be obedient to Jesus? How do we become like him? Well, the same way that a disciple became like his rabbi. We follow, we watch, we imitate. We follow, we watch, we imitate. What did Jesus do? Well, guys, there, there, there's no substitute for it. You got to read the Gospels to see what Jesus did. You got to read the Gospels to see how he interacted. You have to understand, Jesus was a storyteller. You know, Jesus did not answer questions directly. We live in post-age of enlightenment, right? We, we live in, you know, post-modern America. We have all these resources, all these apologetics trainings. We know how to argue. We know how to debate. We know how to Google an answer to a question. We get trained and indoctrinated with an answer for absolutely everything. But when Jesus was asked questions, he never gave direct answers. He either answered with a question or he told a story and then asked questions. But, but if you think that Jesus always had an answer and was shutting everyone down and was arguing with everyone about you know religion and doctrine and theology and politics and relationships, you haven't read your Gospels. You know? So to watch Jesus you got to read your Gospels. And, and, and to be a disciple, you have to watch someone that's a disciple. You know, who is the person in your life who takes the relationship with God so seriously that they're following him closely? That they mimic what Jesus is like? That it's just good to be around them because it feels like what you expect being around Jesus was like. Um, one of my favorite authors, Sky Jitani, tells a story about, you know, w one of the great modern followers and leaders for Jesus, Dallas Willard, and that at this Christian conference, and if you've ever been, you know, there's some really good Christian conferences you go to, great worship, great presenters, you know, the best speakers from around the country as far as the church is concerned. And they get up there and they tell you how to grow your church. They tell you how to follow God. They tell you how to get passionate for Jesus. They tell you how to serve and love your neighbors, to give generously. All these things, all these instructions on what to do. And Sky Jatani's at this conference and all these huge names in American Christianity and Christian book authors and pastors and mega churches, And they have this time of electives where you can go off with all these famous Christians and, and learn from them directly in a smaller setting. And this guy, Dallas Willard, is in a room, and it's a pretty small room, but there's no place to stand because everyone's jammed in there. And why, you know, this old school, older, you know, come to the end of his life and the end of his ministry, pastor, have all these young guys so excited to hear from him when some of the biggest megachurch leaders and Christian authors are leading electives at the same time. And people said, he, it just smells like being around Jesus. It just feels like being around Jesus. Because here's a man who had a humility and who had a softness and who had a... Just love for the glory of God, that it was good to be around him. All that said, how are we going to mimic Jesus? How are we going to become like our rabbi? How are we going to foster a good relationship with God? Because again, when you read your Gospels, you see Jesus all the time prioritizing his relationship with with the Father. He does all this work, and then he sneaks away to have private time. He goes alone, and he prays. You know, every time someone says, you know, oh, good teacher, Jesus is like, don't call me good. No one's good except for my Father. He's always giving glory to his Father. He's always drawing people's eyes and attention to God in heaven. He's never taking that glory for himself, never, you know, holding on 
to honor that was given to him. He's always lifting it up to God. How do we mimic that? What do we do? How do we have the same dreams and the same prioritize? priorities and the same values as Jesus. We have to be in our scriptures. We have to mimic him as best we can. And one of the best ways to do that is to mimic those that are already mimicking him well. But in the context of the three relationships, again, this is not about knowing more. You could read the life of Jesus every single day, all four gospels, you know, cover to cover, every week the rest of your life and not be any closer to knowing Jesus and not be any closer to mimicking Jesus. There's atheists that know the Word of God better than I do. It's not about what you know. And you can check off every box on the Christian checklist. Did I pray, you know, a dozen times today or a dozen times this week or one time this week? Did I read my Bible for 15 minutes every single day? Did I go to church? Did I give my tithe? Did I attend a Sunday school or a midweek service that kept me checked in? Did I go to my small group meeting? Check, 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 check. Does, does everyone know that God's important, that I call myself a Christian? Did I make my point on social media enough that I was doing something for God or I was arguing about politics that reflects God's values or whatever? All that stuff, it is not about what we know or what we do. It's about what is happening moment by moment, day by day in the patterns of our lives. Are we constantly and consistently mimicking our rabbi? If we did human relationships like we do our relationship with God, it would be awful. You know, if I just had a bunch of checklists for my wife, Asia, you know, she wants to hear I love you. So I make sure I say I love you three times a day, and I text her once, and once a week I post on social media how great my wife is. Check. She knows I love her. I know her love language is uh, receiving gifts. So once a month I get her flowers. Once a month, I, you know, give her a little gift card to a spa she likes to go to. Once a month, I, you know, buy jewelry at a little vending machine, and she thinks it's cute. I gave her a bunch of gifts. Check. Um, I read a book, a strategy book, that told me how to improve my marriage, and I did the first three things off the five things suggested in the first half of the book. Check, 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 check. You know, but I never listened to her. I never just sit quietly with her. You know, I just go about all Jeff's busyness, meeting Jeff's needs, doing what Jeff's interested in, but dang it, I checked all my boxes, so Asia, you have to be happy with our marriage. It wouldn't work, and it doesn't work for God. You know, this is why, as the disciples are saying, who's going to be in the kingdom of heaven? Jesus says, you know, there's a ton of people that are going to come to me and say, Lord, look what we did in your name. We prophesied. We did miracles. We cast out demons in your name. You know, we, we did the ministry. We spoke the word of God. We did all these things that were obedient to you. And he's going to say, depart from me. Workers of lawlessness. I never knew you. So many people think that they're checking off all the right boxes. And then the rest of their life, because the boxes are checked off, the rest of their life could be filled with selfish pursuits, self-centeredness, you know, greed, anger, you know, whatever, whatever thing occupies our time and our attention. We fill our lives up with that. But darn it, I checked off all the boxes, so Jesus has to let me into heaven. That's not how it works. God is inviting us into a relationship with him. And that relationship should affect the patterns and rhythms of our day-to-day -day life. My relationship with my wife should determine a lot of what I say yes to and a lot of what I say no to. The fact that I have three kids that are navigating a really crazy COVID world and my daughter's in her mid-teens and my son's about to hit puberty and my three-year-old is just dying for attention all the time, that has to change how I make choices. That has to change what I value and what I prioritize. And our relationship with God should be the same. It should change 
what we value, and what we prioritize. And even as you look at the Great Commission at the beginning of Acts, Jesus is like, hey, I'm about to leave. I'm about to go back to the Father. Here's the instruction. Go make disciples all the nations. Relationship with God, relationship with the church, relationship with the world. Peace out, I'm gone. Before he said that, they're like, is now the time, Jesus, is now when you're going to establish your kingdom? You guys are still focused on the wrong thing. You're trying to determine if this is the end days and trying to determine if this is the sign of the second coming or whatever. I, I'm giving you a job to go into all the world and, and to turn the world into the church and to make sure that church has a good relationship with me, with my Father, with the Holy Spirit. Don't worry about the governments. Don't worry about the politics. Worry about imitating me with all the life you have left. Go make disciples of the world. How do you and I make it so that we're not just checking off boxes? So that, that when we come to the end of our days, when we have spoken our last words, there's a confidence that we are spending our eternity with God because we've spent our life with God. We have a good relational rhythm with Him. I'm going to consult our Three Relationships website to look at the five areas of rhythms with Jesus. So here they are in order. Maybe I got these up on the screen. Maybe I didn't. But they go like this. The first rhythm that we should have in our relationship with God is a passion for God. A passion for God. How do you and I get a passion for God or how do we determine? It's real simple. Passion equals Jesus is the center of my life. You know, I am a nerd for my wife, Asia. I say it all the time. She, you know, she is my favorite human. My favorite person is Asia. You know, I'm passionate about her. I'm excited to be with her. I say good things about her when she's not around. I say good things to her face when she is around. If my kids are disrespecting her, they are going to feel the wrath of Jeff. You know, I'm passionate for her. How Are we passionate for God? Is Jesus the center of our life? Are we nerds for Jesus? Are we talking about good things when, when we're not talking to him and when we're praying to him, are we worshiping him for how good he is? Have you thanked him for who he is? Have you honored him for all of his attributes? Yeah. Or is Jesus just a word on a bumper sticker or something that you post on Instagram every now and again? You know, do you have passion? I lack passion. This is one of my low areas. Passion for God is a low area. And so how do I develop stronger passions? There's a whole list of things on the Three Relationships website that can recommend how to develop more passion for Jesus. Have a thanks journal, a treasure chest of things to remember that God's you know, answered my prayers and he's given me good gifts and he's done important things and built important relationships in my life. Have I meditated and reminded myself about him? Have I read about other believers that were passionate for God? How do I develop my passion for God? How do I make Jesus the center of my life? Next rhythm is scripture. And again, this is not check off, I read the Bible. The question is, in the rhythms of my life, is my life directed by the Bible? You know, is the fact that I have opened up the scriptures, that I've read it, that I have imagined it happening, that I heard the instructions of the prophets, of Moses, of Jesus himself. I read the Sermon on the Mount. I understand the points he was making. And it challenges me uh, on what I do, on how I react to situations. Scripture is my life directed by the Bible. So passion for God and scripture and prayer, conversations with God overflow to every area of my life. You know, that, that it's not just something I say before meals. It's not something I do just before bed. 
I do those things because I am genuinely thankful that God gave me taste buds to experience food, and I am genuinely thankful that he's given me a comfortable place to rest my head at the end of the day, that, that he built rest in as something that our bodies need and crave and enjoy. You know, but as I'm, you know, driving to work, am I distracted by whatever podcast I'm listening to or music's on, or I don't like the song, so I'm switching it up and I keep switching and switching, you know, or am I taking moments to go, God, as I'm heading into work, help the work I do honor you, you know, or God, just thank you that, that, that financially I'm more comfortable because you blessed me with this job. You know, it changes. The conversations with God overflow to every area of your life, passion, scripture, prayer. Not about what you know, not about checking off a box and what you do, but about the rhythms. Do these things make a difference? Number four is obedience. I listen to the Holy Spirit and obey. My pastor Bob Reeves at Calvary Assembly says, you can't experience the Holy Spirit as a person unless you treat him like a person. You know, So often we imagine the Holy Spirit is like the force from Star Wars and I just need to tap into him a little bit to give me some encouragement or to do this miracle or to make this thing happen. You know, but I listen to the Holy Spirit and I obey him. And then number five, identity. I understand who I am in Christ and I live accordingly. You know, I, I have formed my life. I have formed my identity around being obedient and faithful to Jesus. You know, have I done these things? Have I made these things happen? These are the rhythms. Passion, scripture, prayer, obedience, and identity. You know, these are the things that should change the way we live, change what we do, change how we act, change what we value. You know, I, I tell my kids, you know, know your values. Know what's important to you so that you can make good decisions in the moments that you're called to. You know, because if you're just, your biggest value is I want people to like me or I want, you know, to get my way, we're going to do certain things. But if, if my value is honesty is important, kindness is important, generosity is important, those are going to change what I do, how I act, how I behave. And so as you go into your small groups tonight, you look at the assessment, you answer questions. Answer honestly. Be authentic with how you're doing for what, what's going on in your life right now. This isn't an assessment of who you are two years ago or when you first came to Christ. This is an assessment of where you're at right now. You know, Mark yourself accordingly and see how it rates you on your rhythms. Maybe you'll be surprised that like your, your obedience is actually really high. You know, but but your scripture, your engagement, and letting the Bible direct your choices is low. And so how can I use the Three Relationships website to build up a rhythm of letting scripture inform my life? You know, letting it teach me and guide me and change the decisions I make. That's the challenge before us. Jesus said, go Make disciples of all nations. How do we do it? By being good disciples, by mimicking our rabbi. How do we do it? We watch. We follow, we watch, we imitate. We follow, we watch, we mimic. Over and over again. How do we do that? If Jesus isn't here today, we get in our scriptures. We see what he did then. We find the people in our churches, in our communities, that are the best representation of who Jesus is now. We get near them. We follow them. We mimic them. This is our call. You know, this creates authentic faith in us. You know, it, it doesn't reduce us to just robots that follow everything that it said, and, and I can't smoke because that's not Christian, and I can't drink because that's not Christian, and oh my gosh, I can't imagine, you know, having sex before marriage because I learned about that in youth group and all that, like, important stuff. That, that's what Jesus wants for you. That's what he, he expects from you. 
But he doesn't just want you checking boxes. He wants your life to be filled with him over and over. Have a rhythm with him where you draw close and then you go and do what he says. And you draw close again and you go and do what he says over and over and over again. Again, your relationship with uh, your significant other, my relationship with my spouse, I can't just be linked to her arm in arm every day all the time. There's times when we come together. There's times when we're apart. Is the relationship still important when we're apart? You know, as you're starting out, you, you get into a relationship and you do stuff one-on-one -on -one together and then you do stuff in groups and then you're by yourself and then you're back together and, and there's a rhythm and a flow to these things. There's a rhythm and flow to your relationship with God. And the five relationship or the five rhythms in your relationship with God will help you establish a rhythm that feels like it's making a difference. So as we pray and head to small groups, you know, open yourself up to what is one area, what is one thing that I can do that will grow my relationship, my closeness with God, and help me better follow him, watch him, and mimic him. Let's be good disciples of our rabbi. Let's pray. God, you say... That, that your burden is light, your yoke is easy. And as I read your call to go and make disciples, I feel that burden. I feel that I haven't been doing enough. But it's not about what I do. It's about my relationship with you. And everyone watching this, God, I pray that as they uh, do the assessments, as they look at their rhythms and what they should or could be doing more to engage you more regularly, more consistently, more faithfully in their lives. God, I pray that you just give them a, a imagination and an optimism and a hope that their life will be radically different because you, the great rabbi, chose us. We did not choose you. And that you, in your wisdom and your knowledge, in your perfection, have decided that we have what it takes to follow you, to be like you, and to do things like you did. Help that be true of us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.